The Irish government has not inspected one U.S. plane since 2001. So there's something like three million military personnel and their weapons and also prisoners that were kidnapped and sent to be tortured that have gone through Shannon Airport, that have just stomped all over Irish neutrality in the worst possible way, making Ireland legally complicit in war crimes. What's the excuse for that? Because the U.S. says, no, there is no weapons on board. You're taking the word of the United States? The U.S. military is using its civilian airport essentially as a U.S. base. The result of that is death and destruction throughout the Middle East and North Africa. I find it particularly heartrending that some of this material goes to support the Saudi attacks in Yemen, where there are over a million people on the verge of starvation. And after what Ireland has been through in the 19th century in terms of starvation, I find it particularly tragic, bitterly ironic, that Ireland should be complicit in the starvation of over a million people. So our essential motivation was to not be silent. We feel that we have an obligation as veterans and more importantly as human beings to take a stand against the murder. Children are being killed every day by U.S. airstrikes and by U.S. militarism and the wars that they're waging in 14 countries right now. So children are dying. And if you have children or if you have grandchildren, whatever, and you love people, you can't just sit by silently and permit this to happen. And that means something. As a human being, to have the integrity to not be silent in the face of this brutality, in the face of this murder and destruction. I don't want my daughter to ask me years from now, Daddy, what did you do? You were a veteran. You were part of this murderous machine. Did you do anything? I don't want anybody to ask me that. Well, we were aware of the fact that Ireland has an official neutrality policy since 1939. As veterans, having participated in the American imperialist venture and opposing it strongly, we felt it would be particularly valuable to encourage the Irish government to enforce their neutrality policy and stand up to Uncle Sam and set an example for the rest of the world that they don't have to play ball with our murderous policies and could really resist effectively. We felt that it would be necessary to make it more visible to the Irish public, as well as the American public, that this neutrality policy exists and is being regularly violated. I was in the U.S. Army on the 101st Airborne Division, which are paratroopers. We're trained to kill. We're trained to war. In fact, my division did exactly that in Vietnam. I was lucky. I got out before I would have been sent to Vietnam, and I'm very happy about that. I didn't want that on my conscience because both of us have so many friends who suffer on a daily basis from the guilt that they feel from participating in wars like Vietnam, Iraq, And this is one of the reasons why you have 22 veterans a day in the United States that are committing suicide, because they can't live with what they did. It's guilt. We call it moral injury. I don't want our guys to suffer, and I don't want the women and children and civilians who die and get their lives destroyed and torn apart to suffer either. But we have to do something so that we don't become apathetic, become silent. And it's important, and I think if enough people do that, it sets an example. And we feel good about doing it. I don't feel bad that we were in prison for 13 days, so I would do it again and again. Yeah, I served eight and a half years on active duty in the Marine Corps. And when I entered, of course, I was an idealistic young man who believed that the United States was a force for good in the world. And over the succeeding eight and a half years, the Marine Corps showed me that quite clearly the United States was not a force for good around the world. Half of that eight and a half years, I spent in the Far East. The very last part of it, I was briefly in Vietnam. I saw what we were doing there. That's why I resigned my commission at the end of 1966 and went back to graduate school to try to figure out how the United States had gone so far off the rails. And I've been involved in this kind of peace work ever since 1966. We're coming back one way or the other, and we want to come back for trial. It wasn't the Irish people because most of the people, I think, are not in favor of the U.S. military abusing Irish neutrality.
I think the system made a real mistake in putting us in prison because I think we did some good work in prison. We talked to people and we shared things with other people. We felt it was a positive experience, but that doesn't make it right. They really had no right to put us in prison for 13 days without bail. We told them very clearly that we want to come back for trial. That's part of the reason we came, was for opportunities to make visible this travesty that goes on at Shannon with the government ignoring their obligations under the Hague Convention, which has specific obligations for neutral countries. The treatment of Tarek and Ken and the decision of the judge to deny them bail really represents a ratcheting up of the situation by the Irish state. Here we have two elderly principled veterans who would have a very high standing in the United States and indeed would be a big topic of conversation in Ireland should the state take any action against them. So instead of allowing the case go to trial and have the publicity around that, we had the judge denying them bail, which is an absolute violation of human rights as far as I'm concerned. It's an appalling treatment of them to take their passports now and effectively almost intern them in Ireland because they can't go home. They're denied a right to earn their livelihood here, presumably, and they're away from their families and friends in the older years of their life. They could be here here for a year before this case is addressed, which is truly shocking. And we can say that with certainty because some of the other cases of people who have done what the lads tried to do have taken that long to process. I think if you compare it to the likes of the treatment that myself and Mick Wallace got, when we did essentially the same thing to try and exercise our public duty, as we saw it, to do what the government won't do, to examine US aircraft to see whether the undertaking that we're told exists and that they are unarmed and not involved in any military action is in fact true. We had a trial, we were issued with a fine which we didn't pay. In defiance of that, we were sent to prison supposedly for a month, but we served about two hours of that. The discrepancy, if you like, in their treatment and ours is really regrettable as well. And I think the Irish state bear a huge responsibility for this. It's part of a broader process of trying to appear gung-ho, the big boys of Europe licking up to the military elite that's now gaining ground globally. Curry favour, it's probably part of their process of trying to get onto the UN Security Council. So they're probably in a bit of a bind. I don't know what they hope. They hope the lads will go away. Well, they certainly can't go away without a passport. So this issue is going to remain. And I think we have an obligation to do what we can to highlight their case as best as possible. Because I think if Irish citizens really realise that two elderly war veterans who can make a lie out of the government statements, the lads were living proof that it's a lie because they've been through Shannon and they and their colleagues told us that they had guns with them. So what they were doing was right. It was in the realms of trying to uphold international law which the Irish government doesn't seem to have any interest in doing whatsoever so we as legislators but also Irish people in general have a real responsibility now to speak out about this case it's a violation of human rights in a very serious way on our doorstep the more political pressure that's put on that the more impact that it will have justice delayed is justice denied and particularly when these people are away from home it's doubly important that that case would be fast-tracked and that when it is heard that we all stand in solidarity with them as a member of the parliament I think I speak for the overwhelming majority of people who support our neutrality that we are really grateful to the lads for the stance that they took and the best tribute we can pay to them is to redouble our efforts to get involved in the campaigns to stop the military use of Shannon. I'm a veteran of the Irish Defence Forces and have been involved in peacekeeping. We have seen what war does. We have seen the results. We've seen the bodies on the ground. These reports are sanitised in the mainstream media. The reason Veterans for Peace are so committed to preventing wars that they have seen more being involved in it directly and indirectly. It's hugely important to us here in Ireland that two US veterans would do this. It internationalises the situation. These two gentlemen didn't commit a crime. They were trying to prevent crimes being committed and crimes being facilitated at the Shannon Airport. As it happens the following day after they did their action, 10 children from one extended family were killed in a US airstrike in Afghanistan. It's technically possible that some of the soldiers that went to Shannon Airport were involved directly or indirectly in that attack. 
we don't know. It's very likely that some soldiers who've gone to Shandy Airport in the past have been involved in crimes against humanity. We here in Ireland are also involved in a separate project called Naming the Children, in which we are attempting to put names on as many children as possible who've been killed in the Middle East since the first Gulf War in 91. And we come up with a horrific statistic that up to a million children have died or been killed as a result of wars in the Middle East, including those children who were killed in 9-11. Our legal system and our court system has been abused quite deliberately to put people off protesting. We are whistleblowers to a very large extent. Clearly, whistleblowing, exposing crime, is a very honourable tradition and is covered in our constitution. It's hugely important important that our whistleblowing be acknowledged and treated with respect. Two of us went in to do a similar action at Shannon Airport. We attempted to search two US military planes. It's going to take three years before that comes to trial. This is a deliberate attempt to inconvenience those peace activists as much as possible. This trial can be delayed as it's quite possible for two or three years. Then effectively they're being sentenced to two or three years away from their home and from their loved ones in the United States. What's happening in Shannon involves complicity in war crimes, crimes against humanity in which Hundreds of thousands and even millions of innocent people have been killed across the Middle East by the Gardaí at Shannon Airport, by the airport authority and by our government. Back in 1916, Ireland stood up against the most powerful military machine in the world at that time. And that's in the Irish tradition. And that's not so long ago. All of that strife is not forgotten today. I know that. It took a great amount of courage. And I think that courage is still in the Irish people. I expect Ireland to stand up to this monstrous entity, which is called U.S. imperialism and U.S. war making. And I think they can. And if Ireland stands up, it sets an example for the entire world. It is so important. One country standing up and saying, no, we are not going to be part of this. Others will follow. That's why the U.S. and its minions and the people that are making money from, a lot of money is being made from U.S. planes here at Shannon. But that's why they don't want that to happen. It's not only here, but it sets an example for other countries that would like to stand up, and they can do it. It can happen, and people have to start believing in that. The U.S. is the country that's been pushing hardest for the EU to come up to the 2.5% GDP contribution to the military. The U.S. would rather sit back a little bit, provide weapons, and let Europeans go fight than have Americans go fight. And so we see NATO forces in Afghanistan under our pressure. And with a larger EU armed forces, the U.S. will be buying more pressure for the EU to perform these militaristic roles around the world. The United States military industrial complex will become the primary vendor to the European army. We have a policy which says no war on Mother Earth, which connects the war on the environment. It's a real war. It's a bloody business is what it is. And profit is the name of the game. And they are making profit from the death of millions of people. The U.S. has over 800 bases in 80 countries around the world. That's an empire like we've never seen before. And it's a violent empire. There's one purpose of an empire, and that's to extract wealth. And it doesn't matter if you reduce people to poverty or you ruin their country. It's about extracting wealth. So there's two things happening. It's horrible climate change, which we're seeing all over the world in the storms and the typhoons, which is definitely going to get worse. And we have the possibility of nuclear war. This is a dangerous game. I mean, it's more than a business of killing. It's a business of potential destruction for all of us, for the human race. The U.S. military is the largest polluting organization in the world and is condemning the entire planet to death. And that's going to affect everybody. Currently, they're enjoying the bread and circuses, the football games and the television and the pubs and so forth. But we're going to run out of water that you can drink and the enjoyment will go away. We we'll, won't be able to generate the electricity that enables them to sit home and watch the telly. I mean, we are within decades of losing all the material and advantages that have been gathered over the years. So people should wake up and get involved and make the governments heed the will and the need of the people rather than the one-tenth of one percent that controls most of the wealth and most of the decision-making. I think every individual has to ask themselves sincerely, what can I do about this? Because you can do something about it. You can at least not be silent, and you're a better human being, and you feel better. If more Irish people were made aware of this by speaking to their friends who may not be aware of it, that starts to create a foundation on which resistance can be built. All the great martyrs who died were hard 
Glance the house and the door And the souls will never rest Till Ireland is free Of the lies and greed and tyranny Don't appear and come 